The Kerrville Folk Festival has been celebrating songwriters for 50 years. Kerrville's Grassy Hill New Folk Songwriting Contest has featured artists such as Adrian Linker, Anais Mitchell, James McMurtry, Lyle Lovett, Nancy Griffith, and Robert Earl Keane. Here everyone is greeted with Welcome Home, where life is simpler, kinder, and musical. The Kerrville Folk Festival. Put it on your bucket list. Welcome attendees. My name is Michelle Conceison. I'm the programming manager for Folk Alliance International, an artist manager and a professor at Middle Tennessee State University. Thanks for joining us for this panel presented by Folk Alliance International for Folk Unlocked. We recognize the complexity and privilege of gathering online today by sharing a digital land acknowledgement written by Adrian Wong of Spider Web Show in Ontario and adapted for this panel. Since our activities are shared digitally, let's take a moment to acknowledge the legacy of colonization embedded within technologies, structures, systems, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not readily available in many indigenous and marginalized communities. We invite you to join in acknowledging our shared responsibility to make good use of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and active allyship. Further, I acknowledge I'm tuning in from Nashville, Tennessee, the traditional territory of the Shawnee, Yuchi, and Eastern Band of Cherokee people. We hope you'll participate today by sharing your thoughts and questions in the chat. This panel, this panel is being recorded and will be available for viewing for the remainder of the conference once it's aired. The introductions. Uh, you may have noticed all the people on this panel are managers. Don't run away. We've all experienced a year like no other, planning and replanning, especially related to touring. Here, uh, we'll share some stories and approaches we're taking to plan despite the number of unknown factors. We hope this will provide insights and that are helpful to artists, whether self-managed or working with a team. And um, our agenda today, and some of the topics we plan to cover are the plans we had, what we kept and what we let go, uh, approaches then, now, and next, measuring and considering success and looking ahead. I'll first introduce our panels and then we'll operate this panel as a free flowing discussion among colleagues. Panelists, when I introduce you, uh, if you would like to share an initial thought that you bring to today's topic, uh, which is artist planning in an ever changing time, in three sentences or less, please do. This is like a game show. Are you ready for the game show? Three sentences or less. Um, so first, um, please allow me to introduce Charlie Pierce. Please welcome Charlie, who I met because she came bowling with some of my friends one night, <laughs> and I'm glad she did. Of course, that's a fact that I delight in now for its serendipity of just meeting a new person because someone brought you along and they're now our friends. Um, I hope we all get to bowl again soon. Charlie manages Yola and Angelina Presley. Welcome, Charlie. Thank you. Um, well, I'm glad I went bowling too. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I think overall this year, um, it's been a real lesson in being comfortable with the unknown. Um, so much of what we've experienced has been unprecedented, um, although I would rather never hear that word again. Um, but, you know, we can't, as managers, I think we like to plan, we like to have control over a situation. And this has been a real lesson in understanding that that can't always be the case. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Michelle Cito. Michelle, um, let's see, uh, I, we met because you invited me to a 15 minute meeting in a bar at Folk Alliance in Toronto which I, I'm not sure if I'd been invited to a 15 minute meeting before, but you get a lot done in 15 minutes. And now I understand this about you. Um, I'm sure glad I said yes. I learn from you every day. Uh, Michelle manages Donovan Woods, Wild Rivers, Logan Wall, and Devin. Welcome, Michelle. 
Hi. Um, I would like to first of all say that you weren't the only person that was invited to a, 13, a 15 minute meeting. That was my uh, MO for a long time. And uh, I think my my three sentences or less would be that I think this was the year that I was forced to throw out the template of how to manage um, and how to release music. And although it was really unsettling and overwhelming at times, you know, it it was it it has been the most fulfilling campaign that I've ever been a part of. It's been the most creative campaign I've ever been a part of, and I hope that we can continue forward, um, not being templated and not being, you know, formulaic in how we approach managing our artists' as careers. And I will always take that away from me. I will always take that with me um, into years to come. Well, let's starting with words of wisdom, Michelle. Those are good ones. Um, please allow me also to welcome Mark Cunningham. Uh, Mark, I met because I asked a colleague and fellow manager, Holly Loman, to introduce us, and she was kind enough to do so, and you couldn't have been kinder to an unknown from out of nowhere. Um, Mark manages Brandy Carlisle, The War and Treaty, The Lone Bellow, The High Women, Blind Pilot, Noah Gunderson, and Soundgarden. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, my three sentences or less, I think kind of to echo what Michelle said, there's a complacency that you can get into, a routine you can get into as a manager, both as, you know, whether it's project to project or working on the same band for many, many, many years. And I think last year sort of helped shake that up and forced a lot of people to come up with new ways to make a couple nickels uh, add up to a few dollars. So. Uh, I'm excited for touring to come back, and I'm uh, I'm ready for this to be over. So I'll be the sourpuss in the group. <laughs> I think I think we share your feeling, Mark, of, yeah. of being ready. Um, finally, and certainly not uh, last but not least, um, I'd like to welcome Phyllis Oyama, who I met because of this panel. Um, I've heard of her time and again, her reputation precedes her and the incredible artists she's worked with and is working with. Um, and when she called back, I certainly celebrated my luck uh, that she could join us today. So um, uh, Phyllis manages Carrie Rodriguez and Bill Frizzell. Welcome, Phyllis. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so let's see, my three sentences um, echoes all of what you guys have said. Um, and I think the main thing we've learned is just um, uh, flexibility, um, just in terms of like, just rolling with everything. Um, the live streaming, um, everything new that's just been kind of thrown at us. Um, but it's actually been good. It's it's been good just in terms of like giving us time to think and also um, uh, think of things that we've never been able to pursue when artists have been on tour. I'm pausing because I think we need to unpack that one. That's a good point. I think that's um, sort of what are the what's the opportunity and the skills that we've discovered in this time. Well, I appreciate this. Uh, welcome all, and um, thanks for spending time, all of you, with the folk community today to talk about artist planning. Let's uh, let's dive into our first topic, which is plans we had, uh, what we kept, and what we let go. It's really, I really feel like this is a game show. Like plans we had for three hundred um, managers. So we're all used to planning at least you know one to two years ahead of course we seize opportunities as they arise and we change our plans as we go but this is sort of an unprecedented year in terms of how much the ground has been moving underneath us uh, while we don't want to dwell in the past i do want to for a moment take us back to reflect on plans we had for 2020 2021 and which of those parts are your what parts of those plans did you keep um, what did you let go? How did you go about making those decisions for the artists you're managing? Anyone can dive in. This is the spontaneous part. <laughs> well, uh, one of the plans I had was, I mean, for a couple of my artists, uh, specifically Brandy Carlisle, I had a date at the Gorge with Yola and Sheryl Crow 
So I was going to spend a glorious summer afternoon with Charlie, but um, unfortunately that's not happening. It's been rescheduled for this year and hopefully that happens. But I think the, the lesson for me in all of this was of what you keep and what you got rid of was so many artists are reliant on one single stream of revenue. There are artists that make all their money off Spotify and Apple and, you know, just from the recorded side. And then there are artists like most of my artists who basically make 98% of their money off touring. And so when you take that away and it's something none of us ever thought could happen, it makes you realize just how susceptible we all are to like one thing happening and it just destroys the business for everybody. And so it's forced us to, to audible a little bit and, figure out how to keep them busy, keep them active, keep them engaged with their fans, but also it somehow makes some money at the same time. Um, I think one of the things the public is unaware of is how expensive it is to be in a band, how expensive touring is, how low the profit margins are. And so, you know, I work with some bands who can do five, six, 700 tickets in, you know, in 25 markets in the U S and when they come home, the, you know, the drummer they pay makes more money than the principal members. So it's such a it's such a tough business when you rely on one one source of income. And for again, touring, it's so expensive. It's like it's not even that great of a source. So I think it's forced me and my artists to maybe do as much uh, reconfiguring as we can to diversify them where possible moving forward. Yeah, I yeah, please on plans you had. Um what you kept, what you let go of. And maybe I'll add to that, you know, I'm, intri I'm intrigued by this question of, of, you know, rescheduling tour dates versus starting anew. So, so, um, but maybe first, what, what plans did you have that you've kept? What have you gotten rid of? And then we'll, we'll get into reschedules. Well, certainly for um, Yola, the majority of the plans that we had for 2020 went away. And I think one of the things to really acknowledge was that that was quite a slow and painful process. At the beginning of the pandemic, like, you know, I think everyone was feeling reasonably optimistic that this was going to be quite a short term issue. Um, and so, you know, we had, we were actually on the road um, when um, shows started to be cancelled during March. Um, and so there was an immediacy to get people back to Nashville. We were on a bus that, you know, we, it was the first time that we had been out on a bus this year. So even that alone, like financially, was hugely draining, knowing that we had lost shows and then we had to make our way back to town, you know, the implications of, um, what we had signed up to and then um, shows being um, rescheduled and moved or indeed now cancelled. Um, you know, I think some some things we've tried to move, um, a lot of what we were doing um, were actually the support slots or festival slots. And one of the big challenges has been reschedules that are out of our remit and us trying to piece that jigsaw back together and the, the Gorge is a really great example of that like that's a show that you know Yona and I would have cut our arms off to <laughs> to to go and do but it's one single date and so you know that slotting into the plan for 2020 is different to trying to reschedule that for 2021 and then other support slots around that festivals and so you know it has been a real challenge um, and certainly I felt towards like at the beginning it was just delivering bad news after bad news like every week I was having to go to a band and saying hey I know that last week I said that we had cancelled shows up to x point and we were hoping that from then onwards we were going to be back out on the road that's not the case anymore and now we're not going to be out for this next block of time and that was quite difficult to work with um you know we um relative you know Yola's a relatively new artist and we don't have people on retainer or you know paying them salary so um you know it's not an easy message to have to deliver time and again to let people know that their their income and their livelihood is being impacted in that way so 
sorry, on my hand, I had a band that was in the studio in March and, you know, they were halfway through making the record and they all had to go from New York back to Toronto um, because of the pandemic. And, you know, over the course of the summer, we debated whether or not the band can work on this record remotely and just work with the producer virtually. And that was a plan that we did scrap in 2020. And we did completely punt the the making of the second record until, um, well, actually in three weeks from now when the band are going to officially go back in the studio and still going to be virtual. But during the, the summer, you know, we were, we were holding out and we were hoping that this was all going to go away and, and be cleared uh, for them to do that. So, you know, making that change of stopping production on a record and basically holding off 11 months to do it was a difficult decision that we had to make. And we just simply pivoted by releasing two standalone singles um, in between the, that time that we had to fill. Cause, and uh, you know, and I have another artist that was out of a publishing deal and we probably would have waited a little bit longer um, but we sort of, we had time and he had the opportunity to be writing more and he could do Zoom writes and he became a little bit acclimatized to, to writing that way. So um, we did pivot and um, really, uh, and, and negotiated a publishing deal earlier than I think we would have normally have done uh, if the world was normal. Um, and then lastly, I think, you know, we were gonna put out a record for one of my clients in September um, and I was actually the person that really, really didn't want to keep that plan. I tried to convince him that, that it wasn't a good idea. And, you know, we didn't want to suck up airtime um, during, you know, certainly the most important civil rights movement of our generation um, and uh, and during a pandemic. But uh, he convinced me otherwise. He sort of just said to me one day, he was like, if you think that I'm going to care about these songs in 18 months and be able to wholeheartedly and honestly promote this record 18 months after I finished the record, he was, you know, he was just like, it's not, it's, it's just not going to feel like the right thing for me to do. And so we ended up pushing out the record and it was really, really hard um, because there were so many things we had to be sensitive about and had to be cautious about, but I'm so happy that we did it. it ended up being his best debut record ever. Um, and that was not a decision that I expected to make. And I'm glad he pushed me to do it against my my personal and better judgment at the time. But, you know, so we took sort of the good along with the bad. Um, Phyllis, I know you put out a record in the time frame. I'm curious uh, your thoughts on this sort of plans you had and what got done. Yeah, we did. So um, believe it or not, we were surprised that Blue Note wanted to put out Bill's album, which came out in August. And um, I mean, the promotion around it was just fantastic uh, in terms of how Blue Note wanted to um, to plug it. And we got fantastic press. I mean, the hard part was canceling the tours we had to, to support it. Um, but Bill did find some other ways to um, to make these appearances. I mean, he did like a rooftop concert on top of St. Anne's in Brooklyn. Um, he was doing pop-ups in front of his uh, bass player's house in Brooklyn. Um, so, um, I mean, that part was was fantastic. We haven't been able to sort of like string it out, but we're hoping that we can just pick up uh, in the fall um, once we we have a vaccination. Um, and one thing about Carrie that she did that was new was um, she and her husband did a, a song for you. It was like a video performance, just five minutes. She released it every week. <clears throat> um, and then Don Gagne from uh, NPR um, became like a fan of it and ended up interviewing her on it um, Christmas uh, week or the weekend after Christmas on Weekend Edition. And that was like his first um, non-political story uh, after just six months of straight, you know, political reporting. So, yeah. That's great. I think that's a good segue into our next topic, which is approaches then, now, and Next, and when I'm thinking from a strategy standpoint, you know, a lot of times 
we, um, when we're asked what our artists have been doing, we can list the things, like we can list the things that our artists have done in this time. But um, I wanna think a little bit about what the strategy was of some of the choices we made. Uh, it was interesting as a manager myself, you know, the two acts I work with took very different approaches to the pandemic where, where Della May was sort of diving and be in touch with fans constantly sort of doing weekly, multiple times a week streams, cocktail parties with their Patreon and things like that. Um, and John Smith uh, from the UK, who we also manage, had much more of a um, sort of controlled, specific appearance, appearances, um, more about diving into quality and and audio quality and audiophile uh, perfection and 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 um, then the the constant frequency. So I'm curious, you know, when you think when you reflect on some of the choices you made, sort of what was there's the what were the artists capable of doing and what they feel compelled to do. Um, what was the strategy of those choices and, and kind of how does how do you feel that that positions where you're at as you head into planning for the future? Who I mean, you? one of the one of the very practical challenges that we had was that. Um, like two, three weeks into the pandemic, I had to fly home to the UK. So then we were dealing with a time zone difference as well as a geographical difference which you know that that has proved to be quite a challenge I think everyone has you know there and Michelle you must have this as well with John like you know being at like opposite times of the day and trying to manage some of those things and then also just not being able to be present to help with things like audio visual lighting um especially you know managing a black woman lighting her at home can be a real challenge compared to a band of white people who don't have that you know there's more specialist lighting equipment that's required and that was a real real learning curve for us um and then just some of the practicalities around some of the platforms that are used we now know um what works better for audio what was never built for audio and we try and steer clear of like Yola pretty much you know if it's a conferencing audio platform that was never built like that's really difficult to record on and she'll pre-record something that can be put up and and shared on the um platform um but would rather not do something live where the performance is really um, compromised to a great extent. Um, but all of that's been a learning experience um, but that we'll take forward to this year because there's still a lot unknown for the next six to 12 months. One of the things that uh, my artists have learned and have in the past, I mean, not that the opportunity has presented itself per se because it's just, you know, traveling was not an issue, but um, I would say for the first three months of the pandemic, I had artists who are um, published um, staff writers who really were allergic to the idea of doing um, writing remotely and uh, just sort of had given up the idea that they were going to write um, with other songwriters because it just wasn't, it just wasn't the way that they were going to build rapport, especially wow. having Publishers who sort of set them up in rooms and all this kind of stuff. Like it just, it just wasn't how they were going to do things. And, you know, come June, it just, it, it was clear that they didn't really have a choice anymore at that time. Again, especially, so this is specifically for my artists that are staff writers. Um, and I think the thing that really came out as such a blessing for us is in the past, we'd be like, well, we can't write with so-and-so because they're in LA and we're not going to LA for a month or we can't write with so-and-so because they're in London. We don't have a London tour for six months. And suddenly over the course of the last six months, we have had the best writing opportunities we've ever had because they figured out how to do it. They figured out like, what are the approaches that they need to take in order to build a rapport? And therefore, you know, the last six months have been incredibly fruitful 
which has really sort of set us up for the next two years um, with the cuts that they have coming or even just like knowing that it's possible so that maybe when the artists and the, uh, who are also staff writers go on tour, it, it's just going to be less prohibitive for them to also be committing themselves to being a staff writer. And I'm so happy that we discovered that that was a possibility. They overcame it. Um, and I think that's going to be such a wonderful tool that we're going to have to, that we're going to be able to move forward with. I've definitely heard that from other songwriters um, in interviews I've done as a professor and things about, um, I had a conversation with Lori McKenna. She's doing more rights than she's done, you know, in, in a, in a, in a week, she's doing rights that she had done in a couple months. I think that's really remarkable. That opportunity, if it works for a songwriter, uh, it kind of leads me, you know, Phyllis, not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot in terms of, you know, of course, working with Bill, there's recording his own recordings and also collaborations. And he does a lot of collaboration. Is that has it continued to be similar for him or has it been different for him in this time? Yeah, it's been really different. Um, he thrives on collaborations and that performing and not being able to collaborate has just been sort of um basically killing him. The one thing that he has benefited from, which I think is hard for him to recognize, is because he tours so much, um, he never has time to write. So he's been writing like crazy. And um, I mean, because he's been writing like crazy and he has time to actually write a statement of plan, I did recommend to him like, hey, why don't we apply for a Guggenheim? So we did do that and um, cool. they're advancing. So, you know, we'll hope to get that. Um, so that has been a benefit for him. And I'm sure he's just gonna put a lot of this in the can for the future. I wonder about the energy, you know, some, some, some artists have that stage charisma that just like energy uh, the palpable uncontrollable energy that makes an artist an incredible performer um you know i've witnessed some you know some artists struggle with what to do with that energy in this time uh, i wonder if if other managers you know like you've got kind of a, the the how to keep morale up and also just like what to do with that incredible energy um, where to put it? I'm hearing some some stories here. Does that jog anything for anyone else? The my I, you know I have a host of artists and they've all taken different paths of what to learn and where to put their energy. You know, one artist uh, I mean has learned how to like basically build a studio in his house and record you know pretty professional level recordings and that's something they had no idea. I mean, no idea how to do and it's just the time and sort of forced to make these decisions. Another artist got his real estate license and I think he's reconsidering, you know, what the future of music looks like for them. And I'm sure a lot of bands are doing that. Um, and then I have an artist who learned how to tile a bathroom and he is like stepped away from music and really is just like living his life and renovating his house. And, you know, everyone has chosen different ways to proceed through this. Um, it's been really interesting. And like I was saying, I think it will cause a lot of people to reassess how important touring is to them, how important being on the road is. Um, so the next couple of years will be really interesting to see how this all shakes out. And people on the business side, too. It's probably causing a lot of people to go, do I really want to be in this business anymore? It's really hard when things are going well, let alone when it's not going well. And I think not just like reassessing to the extent of whether or not you want to be in the business, but how you want to be in the business. Um, for the artists that I manage and for me, myself personally, I looked and I was like, oh my God, like I have just solely concentrated on my business since I set it up three, four years ago. And I've like, I haven't had a holiday in that time. I haven't spent enough time with my friends and family. And now that business is struggling and I don't know what to do. Like I went through this real issue with like, this is something I've put a hundred, like over a hundred percent of my energy into. And now it's faltering through like nothing that anyone has done around me or that I've done. And I don't know how to deal with that. 
And I think both managers and artists and agents and business managers, like everyone in some way has dealt with that. And certainly for us as a team, we have all, you know, really come to the realization that making sure that you're looking after yourself and doing things for yourself, whether that's learning a new skill, doing some home improvements, taking better care of yourself with fitness, all of that is stuff we want to carry on and not forget that, you know, once things pick back up again, not just put our foot to the floor like we did before and forget to take care of those things that we've realized are so important. Um, and, you know, we, it, that's just something that we have all spoken about and I'm like absolutely adamant we will be disciplined enough to carry carry on with. Amen. Um, on that note too, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. There's a implicit agreement between managers and artists that, you know, we, we manage you through good times and bad times, but so much work, so many people have put in this year and they haven't gotten paid. They're not getting paid. And so then I, I've questioned like, am I obligated to work, work for you at the same level of intensity, which dominates my life? Like Charlie was saying, like, more than a hundred percent when you're not paying me. So am I supposed to work this hard? Do I have to answer your call every second you, you know, every time you call immediately. So it's, it's made me sort of question my life too, and sort of how much I'm going to put into this moving forward. No, not naming any band specifically too, by the way. Just no, in, I think just I in think general. That. Yeah, no, I think I think that's true. I mean, if you've built a, I think if a manager has built a positive relationship with their artist, they trust us so much that that they are turning to us, and and it's sort of the other side of that um, that trust. And uh, Phyllis, I'm going to put you on the spot again. I'm sorry, but it's also interesting to me that you know your work is is your work life balance and home life. Like, how do you is this is how do you balance these these same things. Um, and Michelle, you know, you've been doing this work, uh, you know, far from your, your original home for sure. And just, you know, what are your, I, I kind of want to stay on this topic a little longer. So I'm going to make us do that. Just, just, um, our own reprioritizations and, um, and, you know, maybe also, everyone in our teams have been struggling. So it's, it's our own sort of, how have we kept our teams together? If the artists have teams, have we been keeping those together? Have we been, have been people been taking pauses? You know, what are you all seeing? Well, fortunately for me, we just managed to artists. So it's been, it really hasn't been that difficult in terms of um, sort of balancing work and, and home. Um, and I think both Bill and Carrie have been super understanding about, I think it's been really difficult for, for Bill, especially just because he just, uh, tours constantly. Um, but they understand, you know, that, I mean, it's out of our control, right? So, um, they've actually handled it quite well. Um, I mean, fortunately my husband not only as a music producer and co-manages Bill and Carrie with me, um, but he's a clinical psychologist. So oh, wow. we have one exam. And I am so grateful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I can't speak about how I would feel if we both were in the same boat. So yeah, I feel very lucky, really. And I am getting pandemic unemployment. Um, and Mark, I, I completely understand what you're saying too in terms of um, just always having to be on call, you know? So, I mean, it certainly does run through my mind as well. Um, but I think it's just sort of like the level of events. I mean, for example, tonight, Bill's doing this online workshop with Old Town School of Music. I mean, when things come up, that's when we're sort of like supporting it. And we do have our team in task. We have our booking agent in the US, our booking agent in Europe. Um, and then we have a social media guy who handles all of Bill's stuff. 
Um, but everyone has just been fantastic in understanding. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I work at a larger company um, and I've definitely been really lucky where I was really, really overworked. Um, you know, I probably worked harder this year than I think I've worked the last couple of years uh, for some reason and somehow. Um, and I was fortunate to have additional staff be be thrown my way um, to support the projects simply because it was just not possible for me to work 85 hours a week. Um, and, uh, but I, I very much echo what um, Charlie was saying as far as, I think being a manager and having really worn that as my identity for a really long time um, this year has made me realize that, you know, there are things that I've complained about Nashville not being a walkable city. And I've always been like, that's the one thing I don't like about, you know, the city. It's like you can't walk anywhere and being from Toronto. It's like it is just so accessible. And I realized that that was such a false statement that I had been making for three years. Um, turns out it's there. It's actually just in my literally in the trail behind my house. Um, and I've never known that. I've never walked that trail having lived there for three years. So now that I know it's there, I, I've made a commitment to realizing just some things needed to be shifted around, some priorities need to be realized. And, and that priority, one of those priorities is, is me. Um, I know in the beginning of the pandemic, I, I had a moment where I really fell apart and my artists really got the brunt of that um, of that fall, and they, everybody got a very angry and very lengthy text message from me, uh, which was in hindsight probably a little bit irrational and a little bit angry and a little bit pent up. Can you read it right now, please? <laughs> it was it was not great, um, but I'm so thankful that they were that we we all sort of just like came to a head. Like there was a moment with every single one of my clients where they all received the same text message from me complaining about how hard I work and how little gratitude I felt. Um, you know, and, and it's sort of, there was a moment with each client where we had to say some things to each other. But at the end of that conversation, it was just all recognizing that we're all struggling our own way and it's coming out in our own way. And this was a moment that we needed to release it. It wasn't personal. And I mean, I'm so thankful that I have artists that I can do that with. And it was sort of like a safe enough space where I don't recommend it. It's certainly not how I like to conduct myself in a professional relationship. Um, but thank goodness that we had the kind of relationship that allowed for that to happen. And, you know, we're closer than ever and we're more supportive of each other because we saw a different side to one another in in that in that moment that we all had to just like break and like not be brave for a moment. And uh, so that was important. That was important because I think we, it gave us an opportunity to recognize that, you know, everybody's suffering is different and you don't have to compare pains and, and, you know, and I think that was an important moment that I had to share with them through this pandemic. Yeah, I think I think that like I, I relate. I may not have had like the text experience you had, but I definitely had a win windows of time where I, you know, for for my, you know, I I think it's interesting that we all work at different size organizations. Some for ourselves, and some for for larger companies. I run my own small management company, and it became a goal for me just to keep everybody in jobs. Like I was like, I want the team to still be here when this ends. And to your point earlier, Charlie, about how we kept thinking this was very going to be a short period of time. And then, well, maybe it'll be a little bit longer. And then like, I'm like, wow, I've kept a company running on very little income. For, like it's going to be over a year by the time we see that kind of revenue again. And, and, and it's, it's an accomplishment to keep everyone in jobs, but it's also really stressful. And Michelle and Mark here points about, you know, the boundary, you know, healthy boundaries is what we all strive for. Right. But, but, but I definitely at times I, I had windows of, of time when the pandemic was at different points in height where I said to artists, look, I'm going to ask for a period of time. Just like, let's, 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 let's lay off the team on the weekends. Like let's them, everyone's really stressed. Like I, I sort of looked for how can we, decrease stress but this is an interesting like can we carry what do we carry into the future you know just um uh 
you know, I remember the day that a promoter like wrote me nasty emails because I hadn't gotten back to him in time, like right away. And I was like, oh no, it's back. The nasty emails because I haven't responded quickly enough are back. <laughs> like, like um, you know, how do we practice care and empathy as we try to carry ourselves out of this is, is ever present on my mind. I mean, I think I've learned how I want to manage my business more, but also the people that I want to work with. And I, like one of the boundaries that I would set is that I just am not willing to work with people like that anymore. If you don't understand that we're all struggling in our own way, and you know, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that we haven't just been dealing with a pandemic. We've had, you know, a, a civil rights reckoning that you know none of us have experienced in our lifetime before and we will continue to experience that especially those of us who are working with um artists of color like we can't it's it's very difficult to work through that and um you know learn and try and understand in a way that is um you know you're approaching it with an openness but a real acknowledgement that you cannot understand that lived experience and what they're going through um and then and you know the political world as well i mean last week like you know i'm in in a hotel room in quarantine watching the events unfold in washington and i'm like i can't i mean I'm supposed to have all of this time for two weeks where I can get all of my like accounting done that I haven't gotten to and stuff like that. And my mind was just frazzled. Like, and if there's people within the business who cannot, you know, understand and empathize and wait for um, a response on something on an item that, you know, relatively speaking, is not going to change anyone's life in the next couple of hours. I just don't really want to be in business with them. Yeah, one of the things I, sorry to go back a little bit to, one of the things that I realized pretty early on was like, oh, my job is just not that important. Like in the big picture, you know, like we're setting up concerts and releasing music and it's not that hard and it's not essential. And so it, I, I'm hoping it's going to give me some perspective moving forward where I can go to the gym instead of feeling like, oh, I should work another hour. Or, oh, when I get a text on Saturday morning, I feel like I have to jump to reply and deal with it. So I'm, I'm hoping through all of this, for me, there's been a lot of perspective because it's, you know, it's like music and it's supposed to be fun. And so many people make it not fun because we work with people that aren't cool or we stress out too much about the little things. And so it's, it's been an interesting year and um, I'm hoping we can all stick with these things that we're saying right now, because it's really important. Like we are, we are important. And, you know, the manager is usually looked at as like the, the quarterback of the team and the buck stops with them. Right. So when things go South, everyone looks to the manager too. It's like, who do we have to, you know, help us out. You know, Michelle, you're talking about like, you're keeping your company afloat. Well, who's helping you, you know? And it's just the unfortunate side effect of the way this is, but that's probably why we all get into management because it's really fun. And when things are going well, it's like, there's nothing better. So I know I'm rambling at this point, but I had a lot of things to say. I'll stop. I, I wouldn't call it a ramble. I mean, we love it. We love a challenge, right? Everyone in this room loves a challenge. Yeah. Most of the time. <laughs> Well, we got a challenge, that's for sure. I'd like to move into our next topic. Um, we're coming into sort of the latter part of our panel here, and I'm going to quickly touch on. I'm going to have us quickly touch on measuring and considering success because I want to get to looking ahead. So, um, let's get a little geeky for a second because we've just had this great sort of spiritual conversation about how we hope things will move forward, but but. If we then turn around and measure ourselves by the success metrics that we've been measuring ourselves by, if performance is measured, um, you know, against our of our actions is measured against similar metrics, will we uh, will we not just fall into some of the same uh, ways of planning that we have in the past, which may be targeted at reaching some of those goals? So, um, 
I'm curious what metrics, media, or chart results are you paying attention? What are you paying attention to now is this, to give you a sense of whether or not what you're doing right now works? Um, you know, kind of when and how frequently. What were you looking at before that you're just not looking at now? Um, and do you have a sense of what you might might be using to measure the things you're planning for the future? I mean, I think that the, for, for us, actually carrying on from the last point is one of the things that, especially with Yola, I've um, developed and we've spoken about is, um, I'm not sure if legacy is the right word, because that sounds like something way in the future, but what we're doing is contributing in some wider way. So, um, you know, no longer just like, what streams did we get on a song or like, but how did we use that release or um, art to highlight a cause or an organization that Yola is really um, keen to use her platform to support. So we released a song in October, which um, featured the High Women and Cheryl Crow and Jason Isbell. We had a huge amount of support from all of those artists who were featured on that song. But Yola was like absolutely adamant she wanted to do something and obviously like fully supported by us that um, gave back to some organizations. Um, and that is something that we will continue. And a measure of success is, OK, in, um, you know, what period of time do we want to be in the position where she's able to set up some kind of formal foundation where she can give back on a regular basis you know those those types of things have become increasingly important and I think that we had made the mistake in the past of maybe just seeing them so far ahead in the future we couldn't quite grapple with it whereas we realized that you can start doing smaller things earlier on and yes all of the like social following and um and streaming and that was just a digital release so you know we didn't do physical um copies but we released a merch line like we will still look at all of those measures um but also stretching that out and looking at how we carry that forward and an element of like philanthropy and giving back needs to be a part of our business plan and it will be a measure for us one of the things for me has been their bills and keeping their mortgage up to date and so it's been it's gone from like how much how much money can we make on this tour to where can we scrape money together so they can put 50 bucks in their pocket here and 300 bucks in their pocket there and 100 bucks there and it's really been that dire in some instances because, you know, the faucet has just been turned off. So success for me right now is like for some of my bands continuing to pay the crew. And in some of my bands, it's can they afford to remain a band through this? Can they afford to pay for their their mortgage? So I'm sure once things get back to quote unquote normal, uh, I will recalibrate. But I'm in like triage mode right now. And it's the most important, most important thing. I mean, I love data. Some of you might know this about me. Um, so it's really remained the same. I think that if anything, I've had a little bit of um, opportunity to expand on how deep we go into some of the data, which has been really, really exciting. Um, so uh, that's still important, remains important. Um, and like I said, it's definitely probably even gone deeper into that uh that wormhole. So that's been really great. And uh, same with Charlie, I think like social responsibility has become a very important part of our conversations. And, uh, and I think will definitely remain a very important part of our conversations moving forward. So, you know, even for one of our campaigns that we did this year, instead of using the money that we typically use to buy billboards, and, and uh, we, you know, myself and the artist decided that we didn't really need more billboards with his face on it. And so instead we reallocated the money and hired 12 creators from around the world um, to create art and to, to share their talent. And I think, and it ended up being, you know, it was, it was an idea that we had that was really just for us to do something differently. We thought it would be a fun digital promotion. 
but it ended up being a massive media campaign and that's really all the media outlets wanted to talk about and so I think that when you figure out how to do something earnestly and then wholeheartedly I think it works um and I think people um respond to that so um I think that approach of doing things with social responsibility but doing it in a way that's earnest and wholehearted um is really important and has been really gratifying to spend days and hours of my life um, being able to support those initiatives. Because like Mark said earlier, I think our jobs are not important. You know, I care about the font size on posters far too much. And um, so instead last year worrying about how we were going to hire a dancer in Nairobi to create a piece of music a dance to a song, you know, because I knew that it would help this dancer be able to live for another month and buy groceries, you know, and like really sort of support somebody else's talent. God, what a great way to spend my week. So I think that that was that gratification is, is invaluable. And uh, I think that's a good measure of success. I'd like to move into our final topic, which is looking ahead. And, and Phyllis, I know I didn't let you get in there on that last one. So oh, no we can start with you if you like. Um, but, you know, what are you all telling your artists about planning uh, for the future? It, 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 I, one thing that's jumping out to me is we're, we're still very much in a, in a state of what can our artists do and building around what we can do, um, as opposed to like, you know, the way we used to plan, which was like, we'll make a record in 2022 and it will come out in 2023 and we'll have a tour and like, and everything was wrapping around some creative output where it seems more what I'm hearing from you all is there's these various different ideas that spark action and, and the time frame between them is much shorter. I, I wonder if that's true. Um, I, I wonder how you're speaking with your artists about planning for the future. Um, how receptive are artists to that conversation right now? Um, and um, and also just, yeah, that timing question of, of how far out are you looking at this point, recognizing that the world just keeps changing and, uh, and the state of things is still not yet entirely solid in terms of when will everyone have uh, vaccines and, oh, that might be a, a, a timely thing. But um, thoughts on that? Phyllis, can I start with you? Because I, I like I said, I didn't yeah. get you on the last question. Yeah. yeah, no problem. I mean, I do have hope and optimism that, uh, I mean, you know, I guess it's nine days now when we're going to uh, finally get a new president who believes in science. Um, I do, I do believe that we're going to start making some progress at the, at the vaccines, which will hopefully put all our artists back on the road. Um, so we are looking at booking um, or getting them back in the fall. That's what we're looking at at this point. I mean, things can change. We don't have a crystal ball. Um, that's what we're planning on fall, this fall and beyond. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm just really hoping we will be, you know, making some progress, especially since we have now taken over the House and the Senate. I, I think that um, things, I think Biden's going to be able to finally get things accomplished, unlike Obama. So I do have hope. Additional thoughts. What are you, uh, what are the planning conversations with your artists right now? I feel, um, I mean, the promoters, the venues, the artists, they're all going to need to make some kind of money this year, whether it's 50% capacity or 50% guarantees or something. So I feel like out of necessity, touring is going to start back up, whether it's a good idea or not, you know, medically. Um, it's not going to be full caps. It's not going to be as what it once was, but these venues can't sit idle for another year. Live Nation, the AEG presumably can't make no money another year. And, and my artists need to make money. So, you know, the live stream train is going to dry up at some point. So I would imagine 
I mean, we're planning second half of summer and fall for most of my bands, whether it happens or not is another story, but I think just out of absolute necessity, some of the stuff is going to have to happen. Yeah. Um, you go ahead, sorry. Charlie. Um, well, just to echo what Mark was saying, like, you know, I think you, you have to have a plan. Um, I keep using the phrase with um, our team and my artist of being cautiously optimistic. Like I, I sometimes fall prey to being a little bit, blindly optimistic because I just want to like be completely you know glass half full and this is gonna absolutely like we're gonna do this and I'm gonna help make this happen um this year has really taught us that you like some things just aren't possible like it's so far out of your control and you have to be comfortable with that being the case so whilst we're planning we've also got like a kind of a B plan of okay if we plan to do that and then that doesn't happen what might we do in place of it we've also got um you know there's some projects which artists have had chance to work on which they wouldn't otherwise have had like maybe for film or tv which are a longer lead time so we'll start to see those things come out so we know that there's some content coming um and yeah, we just have to be prepared to move. I think we took the decision um, in the fall of last year to announce a headline show at the Ryman for May. And we still don't know whether that's going to be able to go ahead. We are really hoping that in some format it will be able to be. And so, you know, we're having conversations about what the, the variety of ways in which that event could take place. Um, and maybe we'll have to move it. But right now, like five months out from that show, we we have to hope that, you know, as, as Mark says, like things are going to happen for us and we are all going to be able to, to make some money. Like as much as we want to keep those boundaries in place and the work-life balance and all of that, like the reality is that we are all at this point in need of income throughout the food chain, whether that's managers, promoters, venues, artists, musicians, touring crew, everyone is like really living pretty much on a, a, a shoestring, unless you're, you know, in a, a very different position to the majority of us. So I think we, yeah, we have to move forward on the basis that we can get back to some semblance of touring. Well, it's also um, that notion of cultivating local audience, right? So, like, one thing that's that's fallen out strategically for a period of time because so many things that we're doing are national or international, like, global-facing streams, right? Uh, one strategic question is how do we engage the local audience when the artist isn't locally physically going there or locally physically, like, on that radio station and... I think you're starting to see a lot of plans that are incorporating ways to speak to local audiences more because all, all of these artists' careers were built on building local audiences. And then we've been having these sort of mass messages. And are, are you seeing more, even if a show can't happen, local events coming into play in your plans, any of you? The, uh, I mean, I have bands that are <laughs> so much content for radio stations yeah you know, because they they're in the same you know the same boat i mean wrlt just had that huge fun drive weeks or months ago i can't even remember when because time is nebulous but i mean stations are desperate bands are desperate clubs are desperate i mean everyone and i know congress just approved that money but that was primarily from my understanding for more the venue side of things i mean some artists can go on unemployment but not all managers and not all crew can so it's it's got to we got to get back to it on some level and just hope it's safe enough and people are smart enough um my artists are are all streaming artists um and so for us it's the focus of looking ahead is um just continuing some really specific and strategic cadence and how we're releasing music um and you know we're doing a lot of collaborations 
right now and across genre, which has also been really, really fruitful as far as growing um, our streaming numbers. So um, without real touring in sight, uh, you know, hopefully fall of, of this year, but otherwise, you know, because we are making money through DSPs and, and through digital sales, um, we're going to assume that that's going to be our focus this year, aside from the, the artists that are song, uh, staff writers. Um, but it's just having a really specific cadence of releases um, and, you know, being strategic also with our collaborations, which was really fruitful for us in 2020. So definitely the plan on focusing on how to drive those in 2021. Well, Congratulations on being in the streaming space exclusively. You're the big winner. <laughs> I can't believe how fast this time has gone. I do want to ask, is it, do you all have final thoughts? I've, I've pummeled you with uh, questions on my mind. Um, do you have final thoughts or do you have a question that you uh, want us to talk about? Final thoughts for the benefit of artists viewing this, trying to figure out how to plan for the future. Good luck. <laughs> if you know how to plan for the future, give me a call. Let me know. I think to, to like sum up words from me is diversification. Mark really kicked off with that. And I think the importance of making sure not all your eggs in one basket, like this year, it, like the last 12 months has really, really proven that to us. And that's something that we should continue, like as business planning and um, as managers and anyone who's managing their own career, like you have to make sure that you are diversified in your business and not relying on one income stream. Um, and also the importance of trying to maintain some optimism and whatever you do to do that, whether that is taking some time for yourself to, you know, just regroup and get some headspace, um, but trying to plan knowing that things might change but with you know keeping a sprinkling of optimism in there charlie you're an inspiration with your optimism <laughs> <laughs> you've been locked in a hotel room for two weeks and you're still <laughs> cheerful i love it, <laughs> I love it too. The, my final parting thoughts will be there really is no other job I'd rather have. I mean, I love working in music so much. I love management. As much as it sucks, it still is better than most of the jobs that most of the people I know have. And until that changes, I'm going to try to ride this into the sunset. I mean, I hit 25 years in the music business this year. It's insane. And to me, that's like a huge accomplishment because this, this, this business just spits people out on the business side and on the artist side, you know, it chews them up and spits them out. So anyway, we'll see if I have another 25 in me, but um, yeah, it it's better than other alternatives. So my words to artists, keep writing songs. We need them. The world needs them, whether uh, we know how to distribute them or not, the world needs them. I completely agree with you. And I do believe that music heals. So. It's a good one to end on. Agreed. Um, well, thank you, esteemed panelists, Charlie, Mark, Michelle, Phyllis. Thank you, Folk Alliance, including Jared, Tressa, and Fawn, who helped produce this panel today. Um, I will continue to be available. As, uh, this will be continue to be available as a recording on the Folk Unlimited platform all week. Please take a moment to provide feedback about today's webinar by posting comments in the chat. Um, finally, Folk Unlocked is made available at a pay what you can price point thanks to the generosity of donors. If you would like to support our work, donations can be made at folk.org slash donate. Stay safe and connected, O community. See you soon.